So it's uh, done by two NGOs in Kerala, Cotton Major Society and Alapi Natural History Society. So anyway, we are lucky to uh, get Munib today. He is, uh, I'll give a small brief about Munib. Uh, he's a research scholar at uh, University of Bristol and ICCS Oxford and uh, NCF. Uh, Nature Conservation Foundation. He studies uh, factors that affect ungulate and po po ungulate population at landscape level, and is particularly interested in understanding how mountain and steppe ungulates population can be sustained in human use landscapes. Uh, human use uh, landscape of the Trans Himalayas to ensure the uh, conservation of their predators, examples snowleopards and wolves, while ensuring that local communities are in negatively yeah. affected in the process. Alongside, uh, this is regional hub managers for conservation optimism, hoping to build uh, the movement in India. So that's what uh, I got the brief. From me. Also, uh, over to you, Munib. Uh, I would request all of you to uh, probably switch off your videos so we'll get a better bandwidth. Uh, that's Great. I will just share my screen quickly. Yeah, uh, one second. Great. So, hi, can you see my screen, David, and everyone? Just to, just yeah. to confirm. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Can oh, okay, great. And you can hear me well as well, right? Yeah, hear you. Yeah, hear you. Nice. Okay. No, well, thanks. Thanks so much for that introduction, David. That was really nice. Um, as David said, like, you know, I'm a PhD student that looks at disease, uh, but I'm also a regional hub coordinator for a movement called Conservation Optimism. And that's uh, what I'm going to speak about today, actually. So it's not going to be about my, my professional work, but more sort of um, something that I'm involved in, uh, in, a, in a, at a more personal level. So like the title of what I'm going to speak to you about today is Realigning Ourselves with Nature and Building a Hub of Conservation Optimists in India. So uh, I mean, and I really, really thank everyone for being here because obviously it's a Friday evening and you guys are taking time out to listen to me. So I really appreciate that. And I hope uh, through my talk, you guys can have some nice uh, thoughts that pop up. And if there are questions, please keep, keep, uh, you know, keep asking those and we can have a discussion. So just to let everybody know, I think I'll speak for maybe half an hour um, and then we can have a discussion after that. So I don't want to speak for too long. Um, you know, just to start off, uh, I know this this time is really, really tough for almost everybody. You know, we, we are living in, in, in lockdown. This COVID-19 crisis has really affected almost all of us, be it physically, psychologically, and economically. You know, it's literally brought the world to a standstill. And, you know, and it really makes me think about one thing, you know, where does it come from? And like a lot of the proximate uh, answers to that are people are talking about how you know there was there was this jumping of viruses from 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 wildlife to to humans in a uh, in a wet market somewhere in China and then it spread after that. But you know even that even though that that's a proximate cause of this of this issue, it always made made me think you know what is the larger picture here? And you know all of us when we work on work in conservation or and look at issues with nature, I I I always feel like we always get stuck with the proximate cause. You know the last. Uh, point in the chain of reactions, uh, but we forget the bigger picture. And I think this pandemic today, alongside other things, has really questioned and brought in front and brought to the light, in my opinion, our deteriorating relationship with nature. For instance, let me use this pandemic uh, as an example. You know, as I said, the proximate cause, if at all, was was the jumping of that virus from, let's say, animals to uh, to wildlife in in that wet market. It has to be contextualized within a larger uh, understanding of you know deforestation and destruction that we do to our to our natural habitats that might bring you know wildlife and people people close uh, some some of me, uh, some people might argue but you know sometimes people and wildlife are not separate you know they're together and what i would say to that is but the way we deal with our natural uh, environments you know by destroying them might result in stresses to these animals that you know generally when people and wildlife might be living together because of those added stresses, the way we're dealing with nature, like you know, changing our land use, cutting trees, cutting forests, uh, so on and so forth, might result in an increased probability of these, of these, uh, you know, stressors and uh, of these um, diseases occurring. Alongside this, you know, we live in a goal, uh, world of huge global travel, you know, and and again, coronavirus has really showed us how fast diseases can spread from one to the other. 
facilitated by a huge sort of, um, uh, you know, just our interconnectedness throughout the world. And again, the larger context with which we live in, in is, is that of climate change. And again, when it comes to disease, you know, maybe what we have to think about is the changing climate can increase or even decrease, or rather effect is the word, I guess, um, these disease causing organisms because a lot of their life histories are driven by climate. So I think the, the point I'm trying to say with this slide is that whenever we're thinking about issues with our climate, uh, with, our, with our environment and nature, let's not forget the larger scale, the broad pictures. Let's think of the ultimate causes of certain things rather than just the proximate. And I think, you know, we're living in a stage, uh, we're living in an age where our relationship with nature is really deteriorating. So we have to really come out on the other side of this global crisis, um, really thinking about that, you know, and seeing if something we can, if something at all uh, we can do about it. So this clearly shows, you know, conserving our planet is important. I mean, I don't need to say this to any of y'all, and you know this better than I do. So conservation is important. And, you know, one might say, why is it important? And it, it, it seems like a very obvious question, but it's really important to break it down. And the way I think of it is, conservation is important because humans and nature are linked. I, I, I personally believe, and we can discuss this, I personally believe is they're, they're linked. And that's because nature provides us with the fundamental, fundamentals of existence, right? Like it provides us with the water we drink, it provides us with the air we breathe, the food we eat, so on and so forth. So without nature, you know, our fundamental existence would not be there. But in addition to that, you know, nature provides us with human development, as I call it. Um, for instance, you know, it's through nature that people can do things like agriculture, uh, for, uh, for instance. And also, to a lesser extent, uh, but highly important as well, uh, nature can affect people's quality of lives. For instance, for a city dweller, maybe going out to, you know, to the mountains for, for a trip can really, you know, help them with the way they can... Uh, with the way they sort of deal with their day-to-day -day lives, with their well-being, more mental well-being than anything else. So nature and humans are linked, and that's why conservation is important. And the other step, the other thing that I want to say right after this is that each one of us can play a role. Sometimes we think, you know, oh, okay, okay, great, nature and humans are linked. So the role of conservation falls upon conservationists. But I really want to argue with this presentation today and talking through uh, conservation optimism that I will in a bit, that each one of us can and should play a role in conservation. And, as, and, and the reason is, as I said, hum, because humans and nature, uh, you know, human and nature are linked. So be it anybody in your daily life, for instance, you can, you can make a difference by, let's say, walking to work or cycling, if you can, not using plastic bottles when, 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 when possible, for instance, you know, recycling your clothes, if, um, if, if, uh, if you can, because I'm not, or, you know, buying a lot or recycling uh, or, uh, you know, composting things. So I think all of you know this again, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, not only conservationists or what we define as conservation scientists, if I may, uh, have a role in conservation. All of us do. But, you know, there is a conservation conundrum. Uh, there are issues within conservation, right? And three of them I've articulated here. There is a notion especially in conservation literature and also conservation practice, especially in a country like India, that, you know, humans and nature are separate. You know, there are, there are lots of examples about forced evictions, you know, be it from our tiger reserves uh, or be it from other natural hardcore protected areas where authorities or even people might think, you know, uh, nature and people are separate. Um, so there are these issues. Also, conservation issues in general are supremely complex, uh, especially when it comes to the social and economic complexities. For instance, if you look at a lot of fisheries related examples, I mean, India has one of the largest uh, coastlines in the world, right? Uh, we have, if I'm not mistaken, six states that sort of fall uh, along the coast and obviously two of our island uh, union territories. And, and, and these areas, you know, are extremely complex because here you want to conserve, let's say, a natural resource let's say, the fisheries, but at the same time, these fisheries might be incredibly important to people's livelihoods uh, and even food security. So then how do you balance the two? And in, uh, at the bottom, uh, it just sort of depicts that, you know, working in conservation in general or nature conservation, in certain cases, can also be extremely physically and mentally draining. For instance, you know, I work in the Trans Himalayas for a lot of my work where, you know, where, where 
it is quite hard um, when you're walking long transects at these really, really high altitudes. And also, you know, you're just isolated sometimes, you know, from friends and family and, and just your peer support group. So it can be quite mentally taxing as well. So I think what I, the point I'm trying to strive with this particular um, uh, slide is that while conservation is important and aligning ourselves to nature is important, there are these issues and conundrums within that that we, and these are not all of them, these are just a few uh, representative ones that I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight. So, so then you ask yourself, you know, is it all doom and gloom? Like, do we do is there anything that we can do you know we as where where we only have one planet the population is growing i mean we're almost what seven seven billion people we need to we need to feed them but we need to make sure uh everybody has a good quality of life and we have all these issues how do we how and what are we going to do if at all right it really seems like a really really monumentous task to say uh, it's all well and easy for me to say on, on paper or on this call that, hey, we should align ourselves to nature, but then how, right? Like how exactly should we do that? I think this is where conservation optimism comes in. And I would like to read out exactly what's written at the bottom of your screens. So I'm just gonna move this here. So basically says, individuals with an optimistic outlook routinely maintain high levels of psychological well-being during times of stress than those who are less optimistic. As a result, these individuals are more likely to accept the reality of stressful and challenging situations and take direct action to overcome the adversity and attain their goal. So I think there, 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 there lies a very, very, very important message. It's a message of hope, but a message of hope within action. In fact, I think there is a scientific paper that I've uh, put up on the left of your screen, if, you, uh, if, if, if the screen is clear, that basically talks about how everyone loves a success story, you know, optimism can really inspire conservation engagement. And while I talk through the next few points, I do really want to make sure uh, uh, that people think about the fact that what I say is going to be at the at sort of the crux of, or at the intersection of all conservation intervention, but also people's well-beings, you know, people who work within this sector potentially. And what is the rationale behind this, you know? So there is enough, um, sort of uh, evidence to show and also enough uh, uh, work that basically says, you know, the truly, the truly scary information has a nasty tendency to get ignored because people don't want to, you know, learn it or think about it. Uh, and as, it's, as it says on the slide here again, to muster public and political support on a scale that matches uh, our environmental challenges, uh, research consistency shows that negative messaging is not the most effective way forward. So for instance, I'm sure all of you guys, you know, who are interested about nature conservation or, or just vaguely even interested uh, as a hobby or as a profession, know every day you, you read about climate change or some issue uh, or even now in today's world, like about COVID and it's all negative, right? Like it's all, I don't know what you guys feel, but maybe this is a question for us to discuss later, but like it's always about, oh, it's so bad. What, like, very few times is it about, okay, it's so bad, but you know, what can we do about it, right? And I think personally as well, and as, as you can see from this slide, it basically deters people from either wanting to read more about it and think about it definitely, right? Um, and I think clim the climate change literature is, is, is a great example about that, which always talks about how, you know, there's climate change, there's global warming, the poles are melting, sea level rise is gonna, uh, you know, affect, these many people by this much, this many years, blah 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 blah, and I think people uh, turn a blind eye to it, and we do it in our daily lives as well, right? Like you know, when there might be a negative situation with with one of our loved ones or a friend, we tend to ignore it and try to sort of, you know, keep it away and deal with it later, or or not think about it because it affects our psychological state of being, but also you know just affects our daily lives. So it's something to think about. Munib, sorry, nothing in between. Sure. Uh, there's a few messages I got. Uh, can you just slow down a bit and a uh, little louder? So okay. It's a bit faster. Sorry to. Just... No problem. No problem. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, so after going from the from the rationale, like I think it's important to focus on on solutions. Is this good, David? Is this a bit better in terms of the? Yeah, that's that's uh, fine. Yeah. Thank great. You. So it's I, I think it's important to focus on the solutions. For instance, I've just put a few snippets here uh, of four stories that were published in, in 
Longer Bay India, I think in 2019, early 2019, but from 2018, about these stories of, of solutions or stories of uh, positivity, where, for instance, uh, there's uh, a story of the pygmy hog, which is a critically endangered species in Assam, and how a rehabilitation program there has really helped you know, them bounce back to a certain level. How there was this um, article about how linking your cup of Assam tea uh, to elephant conservation can be done. And I truly believe, you know, in the sea of negativity out there in the world, uh, where biodiversity loss is a reality, climate change is a reality, you know, uh, uh, there is a lot of issues when it comes to people's livelihoods uh, at the forefront of conservation. There, amongst all that sea of negativity, there is a mosaic of positive stories. And I genu genuinely believe, and I'd like to see what you guys think, it is these positive stories that have the ingredients to teach us how we can actually, you know, rebuild our relationship with nature as a society and actually achieve, you know, the principles and sort of uh, our, our goals of conservation. So it's almost what I'm trying to say is that, you know, when we look deeper into these stories, and there are very few of them out there in the world, uh, you know, in terms of out there on the media or like on the platforms that we might be engaged with. So these stories really have the key uh, to sort of helping us. And you might ask, but what about the failure? Because not everything is a success, right? And that's where I'm reminded of this quote by, by Malcolm Forbes that basically says, you know, failure is success if we learn from it. And I want everybody to like take a moment uh, to think about that. You know, you might be working within conservation or not, or in any of your uh, personal spaces. How many times do we stop and think to ourselves that, you know, hey, even if I failed, what can I learn from it, right? I know it's very easy for me to say, but, you know, as an institution or as a, as a domain of science, where, for instance, uh, when I talk about conservation science, we haven't really embraced that concept. So just going back to the previous slide uh, here, what I'm trying to say is, if we, if we truly want to achieve uh, rebalancing ourselves with nature, we really have to focus on these solutions that are there, but also really strive hard to learn from our failures. I mean, for instance, I as a, if I can call myself an early career scientist, if I call, like I've had many failures already and maybe my career has only been maybe six years long or something. And at the start, obviously it really affects you, but it is in those failures that you also have the ingredients of success, you know, that you can learn from and build towards. So, so these two points are important, right? Uh, learning from our successes and building on our failures. And when you ask people, so this is an exercise I had done uh, with a couple of, uh, during a workshop, uh, what, what does conservation optimism really mean to you? And it's really interesting to see this uh, sort of word cloud that I've made. People think of it from the angles of having hope, having a future, you know, conservation itself. There is empowerment, there is action, there is resilience. So while you look at this, and there's inspiration, as you can see at the bottom as well, uh, while you look at this, you know, ask yourself, isn't that what we want to build towards, right? And I know I'm very, very theoretical right now, uh, and I'm very uh, sort of conceptual right now, but again, as I said, if you believe that we are living in a deteriorated relationship with nature today, and if we want to build towards a, a realignment with nature, you know, can we not use those success stories? Can we not learn from our failures to build an optimistic future for ourselves that is that is sort of hinged on our reliance and our and empowering each other, being action oriented, uh, and you know, hopeful for our future. So that's what uh, conservation optimism uh, is. And this is a bit of a theory of change behind what we do. So basically. Conservation optimism was a, was a movement that was started, sort of happened by, by different people talking to each other, as we, as we said, you know, and our rationale was that, you know, species are declining, ecosystems are being lost. So I'm like talking about the area of change that you guys can see now in the green, which is our rationale. So we know that species were declining, ecosystems are being lost, conservation can be effective, but there isn't enough of it. Uh, focus too often on threats, you know, not on solutions, Conservation is seen as too narrow and it's not inclusive enough, you know. This, this empowers people and causes them to give up. 
So this was just like a bunch of us thinking about it, right? Like sort of some of us being academics, some of us being conservation scientists and others sort of in the middle. And we, we all agreed that this is the state of the world today. So we thought, you know, using that rationale and then sort of pumping that into some activities such as building a community that agrees that this rationale is an issue and we need to do something about it. Creating resources so we can go from the state of doom and doom towards a state of action oriented um, uh, sort, of, sort of ethos for nature, uh, raising funds to do these activities and outreach things um, and, and outreach, as I said, to connect people. So we thought, okay, these activities are important to then have certain outputs, right? What are those outputs? Those outputs would be, you know, having collaborations and partnerships with people all across the globe or, uh, you know, given uh, like the work that we're starting to do in India at a regional level, as you can see from the regional hub, having hubs that work together, you know, a network in an online community, but also material. Like it's important to have material that allow people to, you know, uh, to, to, to actually achieve the things that they want to achieve, because sometimes that might be lacking, and have an active dialogue between the public and the conservationists, which I think is lacking, especially in India, right? I feel like the conservation body says something or does something, whereas the public might be completely away from it. And the reasons why these outputs are important, because we want specific outcomes and then our impacts uh, with respect to our rationale. And those outcomes are, each and everyone, be it a normal person who might have a day job, a nine to five, nine to five day job in a corporate company, or somebody who's working within conservation as a conservation scientist, or just you know a teacher in in a school, whoever it may be, any person to feel empowered uh, to act for nature. So you have to provide them with the stories, the tools, and the resources to 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 really direct them to do something. So they they do feel empowered to act for nature. And also, as, as, as I said, sharing stories, uh, learning lessons from them and, and replicating those successes, which is the outcome, with the eventual impact that will have improved trends for species and ecosystems uh, in the world. So we just, we, we thought it's important to do this sort of theory of change uh, because it, it really gives us something to look back at and sort of track our progress against. So what do we do? So as I said, we're a movement right now and we're, st uh, we're starting to sort of register ourselves as a non-profit organization. So we have a branch in the UK, but we've just started uh, with a branch in India. Uh, so as I said, we have four main activities that we, uh, we are doing right now. We're trying to build a community. Uh, here it talks about building a global and inclusive community, uh, which is more at the level of the, the global movement. But uh, what we're trying to do is do the same uh, at the uh, at India at the level of India, um, you know via our website, our social media channels, but also uh, a conservation now network of optimists worldwide, as we call it, which is basically connecting with people through through events, uh, seminars, and or talks like these, uh, and really building that, creating resources for people such as guides and online courses uh, to do things like um, you know maybe learn specific skills within conservation or how to uh, write. Uh, more optimistically about conservation in general. Uh, also reaching out, uh, getting, we organize, you know, diverse set of events, as I said, such as a summit and film festival, which I'll talk about in a bit, but also do a lot of outreach work with schools and museums. Uh, we haven't done so much in India yet, but that's mm -hmm. the hope. And obviously also fundraise uh, to allow for these activities to go on. So just an example of a resource that we've made, uh, we, have, we have a toolkit that we made it's called Framing for Nature Toolkit. So it's a basically a guide to how words can help my life. In other words, it's a toolkit. It's like a book of about, I think, eight to 10 pages, uh, quite, quite visual, which basically helps you um, uh, navigate through how you can write better for nature. So as I said, a lot of the writing, a lot of the communications around, uh, around, our, our, uh, uh, around nature and conservation is quite negative. So it, it needs to be more action-oriented and it needs to be more proactive Right? So this is a bit of a framing toolkit and it's quite interesting because it runs you through uh, what values people might have and how that might shape their uh, writing or thinking, you know, um, and what are some of the, some of the, some of the tricky things that people should uh, avoid uh, listening into or, or, or writing. So this is sort of a resource uh, that people could use if they're interested in you know, writing more about nature as an example. 
uh, in terms of amplifying diverse voices, we've just started a two series on uh, our recently launched India Instagram handle called Conservation of Films in India. Um, we have these two series. One is called Humans of Conservation. Uh, I'm sure many of you already know about the whole Humans of New York um, thing. And basically, the, the point of this, uh, this, this small project is to highlight people's stories. You know, it might be the smallest of small stories of, let's say, somebody living somewhere, doing their little bit for conservation, or it could be at the level of a policy of a country. Uh, but it's just these stories, uh, you know, that might uh, that might inspire people, but also have ingredients of uh, success or positivity or learning from failure, as I said. And then we have this other uh, small project, which talks, uh, which is basically titled "When Life Gives You Lemons," uh, which alludes to the 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 metaphor, you know, lemons being sour, but then you have to turn those lemons into lemonade. And it sort of has that ethos. And it's a video series where we ask. Uh, people within conservation actually, well, this is a bit more specific, um, to talk about how they have dealt with some of their difficulties, right? The idea there is, you know, they talk about their difficulties and, and but we really force them to think about what did they learn from those difficulties and, you know, what are the, what are the attributes that are helping them to deal with those, uh, those quote unquote lemons in their lives and what is their lemonade, right? Um, and I think uh, it's important uh, these platforms are important because they get these stories out. Because a lot of times I feel, especially in India, you know, we, 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 we all live a little bit in our cocoons and in our bubbles and we don't really share some of these things. You know, we might share it with our friends and whatever. But when you zoom out, you realize you're literally, I mean, you are actually in the same ocean, but maybe in a slightly different boats, definitely. But it's important to see how we can mutually understand some of these things. So that's about amplifying the diverse voices. But just another point here is also we're hoping to do these in different languages. So um, at the UK uh, level, where we work a little more globally, we've done this, you know, in, in I think Russian, uh, Kazakh, um, if I'm not mistaken, Kiswahili, so on and so forth. But at the India level, obviously, we'd like to get as many regional languages as possible because it shouldn't be a barrier for somebody to, to really share their story. And some other outreach events, uh, you know, we've had workshops around this. Uh, we've, done, we've made some material, as you can see at the bottom with the humpback whale, which is sort of more uh, for, for, for children and, and sort of, you know, uh, middle school, lower school children uh, about different species. Uh, here, as an example, we have the humpback whale, but there's a very simple description and we've done some coloring material as well. And, uh, had workshops. Um, the two pictures that you see on your right were workshops during SECS, I think 2018, about exactly what I'm talking to you about, the, the importance of conservation optimism in aligning ourselves with nature and what we can do, uh, you know, uh, what we can actually do to achieve that. Uh, I do want to take a couple of minutes to talk about the summit. So, you know how we, there's different conservation uh, conferences or ecology conferences or just uh, any field, I've almost every field has different conferences. Uh, we organize, or rather we organize conferences uh, every two years. We haven't done this in India yet, but we hope to do this maybe next next year. So maybe in 2021 or 2022. Uh, but we, uh, we've hosted a couple already in the UK. So just to give you a sense of what they look like, the point of these summits is to get people, a diverse group of people from across the world and have a very, very relaxed and not so formal format the way a normal conservation conference would have to talk about some of these conservation issues and then really learn from each other. So for instance, for this summit in 2019, we had five plenary speakers from I think four different parts of the world giving their expertise on um, you know, conservation and conservation issues in their landscapes. For instance, we had, I think, a speaker from Namibia talking about uh, something called CBNRMs, which are basically community-based resource, ma resource management reserves uh, in Namibia. So giving her perspective about it. We had seven creative sessions, uh, and this is something we really lack, right, within conservation in general. I feel like um, it's quite hardcore and very, very sort of uh, sciencey sometimes, but we realize, we forget to realize that a lot of uh, issues in conservation maybe can better better be understood, also communicated in more creative means uh, by maybe collaborating outside just our circle of conservation scientists. So for instance, in this summit, we had, I think, like a, um, if I'm not mistaken, we had like a wallpaper drawing session about uh, 
species and how to communicate through through those things but we had seven different types of those we had 10 not a poster sessions so that was a fun one the idea there is that you know how generally you have a poster to present your work here you would present your work by anything but a poster uh, so that was interesting and it allows you to be a bit more creative and we had 18 different workshops panels 13 speed talks uh, it was a three-day summit uh, and there were two free events you know, during the summit as well and four sort of ed that style talks where people would <clears throat> talk about a certain specific topic uh, in more of a sort of a knowledge sharing format and and this was a huge success because more than 230 delegates from over 30 countries came and also part of that summit which um, was the, was this thing the, the film festival which i thought was amazing so basically the idea there was there were these short films that we asked people to submit uh, either you know ones that they have already made or ones they wanted to make and then we had specific uh, sort of categories for these films like student films which are you know age categories around for students uh, you know young voices uh, student films and young voices were the same uh, people in nature uh, films about people in nature and deep, uh, films around conservation works, so conservation story, learning from successes and failures. So this was an incredibly amazing event and it was ho uh, hosted in the uh, Oxford Natural History Museum and we also had three judges of which one, uh, one of them was Prasen Jit Yadav, which a lot of you might know from India itself, who's a natural photographer. And we had a great conversation about how filmmaking and storytelling through films can be a great means in, in really bridging some of the issues within conservation and also learning from it. And it, it, it got a lot of amazing uh, views and um, receptions from, from, from a lot of people. So I just want to show you guys, a quick, sorry, I just want to show you guys a quick video about the 2017 summit to give you a sense of what this looks like, for instance, and what people speak, uh, feel about it. And it's almost um, as uh, trying to suggest and show to you guys how, what we might, what we're hoping to do uh, once we, Hopefully, can get a, a summit of like uh, of this sort of to India in a couple of years' time. So this is obviously from a UK context uh, from 2017. But we'll give you a sense of flavor. David, let me know if you can't hear it properly. also between science and art and social science and people with a real generosity of spirit towards other people's expertise. Conservation is beginning to come together and trade ideas and information more freely and as long as that continues I think there's great future. communicating in an enthusiastic way about the way in which we can make a difference and part of it is about as professionals um, thinking hard about our successes and our failures but not being that hard to find them. Another poster. Conversation is really interesting. Seeing how people can, you know, display different things without the normal way of presentation through slides and stuff like that, and you get to understand about conservation. 
Like conferences like this just reassure you that there's so many different members that are practicing conservation. Because I go to a lot of grim talks on climate change and all of that, I, I do myself go into a pattern of denial and resistance. And when I'm here today, I just actually feel like going home and doing more, and it's re-energizing me. So I absolutely think that, that having given people that um, that mandate or that excuse or that possibility, it's it's making us all feel better and more effective. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, just just a just a just a flavor of uh, what that looks like. And um, as I said, uh, just going back to. Uh, just taking a few step backs to our uh, theory of change and the idea with these kind of summits uh, and it doesn't only have to be summits it's, it can be events you know the, through workshops and, and and collaborations the vision really is you know when you collaborate and partner when you build these hubs uh, you build these uh, places like, like a lot of you know the the, the the two nature societies that have organized this event have done already which is great and when you have active dialogue between you know public and conservationists and you have these guiding materials and network especially online and even offline, it only says online here, you then have these stories that you can learn from, you know, and replicate those success and, and learn from those failures. And then everyone can feel empowered to act on each other. And, you know, there is that output of hopefully improved trend uh, in species and, and, and ecosystems. So we can talk about that. But just to finish off very quickly, uh, at the global level, you know, we've developed a network of, of, of many, many different organizations across all these countries that you can see on the map in front of you. But what I am hoping to do with, the, with my colleagues who are also interested in this is sort of build a bit more concerted effort in, in India, because I feel like, you know, India is a, as we all know, you know, it's a country of over a billion people, but at the same time, there, it is a country with the highest number of tigers, uh, one of the most important uh, populations of uh, elephants, and just the plethora of diversity of different species, uh, all the way from amphibians to reptiles to, to fisheries. So I think, and also different people working in it. So I think it's important to, get people together under this umbrella so we can network, learn from each other and do something. Uh, so that's where, uh, that's where I'm coming from. And we also have this, uh, this, this app we're building called Key Conservation. So it's kind of like, think about, um, it's, it basically tries to connect uh, the people on the ground to people who might want to donate, for instance. You know, it's an app where you might, you might put up things like, you know, hey, I work in conservation in, in, in a natural society A and, you know, we need some, some binoculars to help with bird mon monitoring. So you put that up as a request, almost you know the way Instagram works or whatever. And then might some other person who's on that app who um, might be keen to help out, you know, might see okay that binocular only costs hundred rupees or whatever, and they'd be happy to donate that. And in return, you sort of send a photo or a video of how that binoculars has been used. So it sort of you know bridges that donation gap uh, or uh, granting gap. It's called key conservation. So we can talk about this. A little more. It's not out yet, but it's in its final testing phase. And last and final, we're also doing a, a survey online. Uh, and this is just a shout out to anybody who might be working, studying, or doing research in conservation to tell us a bit more about your life in conservation. So, this is a survey to understand what are some of the challenges that you might be facing in conservation, especially related to mental health, because that's something that we don't talk about. The hope in this survey is to understand these issues and then see how we can advise both institutions, individuals, and also uh, just conservation as a domain as to better dealing with these uh, situations. So if you guys uh, are free and if you do work on, and study or do research in conservation, I'd be really, really glad if you uh, wanted to take, it takes eight minutes to do it in, and it's in different languages. Uh, so I can share this link with you. And I think with that, that's all I wanted to say is so thank you very much for, for listening in to me. And these are some of our contact details if you want to reach out to us and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions or discussion points. Thank you so much Munip. Uh, it was good to hear you and uh, let's uh, open for questions. If you guys have any questions, please come to the chat box. So,
Okay, I think there's a question coming in. In India, the, the EIA is approved by many scientists who don't even conduct proper studies about the land and its ecosystem. Hence, when presenting a case before the National Green Time Union, it becomes challenging to prove that EIA is improperly. So, how can we be conservation optimistic? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think the important point to say there is, uh, I think it's not in that case. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say just sitting and uh, being optimistic is the right thing to do because it isn't. I think the point there is uh, the larger point, right? As I said, you have to take a step back about. Um, like this is the proximate issue. The fact that you know the EIA is uh, is approved by many scientists who don't conduct, conduct proper issues is is a proximate issue. The ultimate issue there is the fact that there are structural issues, you know, the in the way in our ethics and and things like that. So I think the way I would answer that is that there is no short term solution to that. There's a long term um, ethics with which we have to breed our uh, researchers and 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 people and community as a whole. So as I said, when you, when you try and bridge that gap between people and conservationists, what might happen very soon is when things like this happen, the public will pick it up and say, hey guys, this is absolutely wrong. And I think that's where conservation optimism comes in, uh, not in the exact, not in the direct sense. It will not allow us to stop that EIA um, you know, mismanagement, but it might hopefully make a, make a structure into the future, which uh, will allow us to be a bit more uh, a bit more robust against these issues. So I think it's a long-term thing versus a short-term thing. So I think it's important to not uh, be carried away by the fact that something is uh, something, just being optimistic will result in something happening. No, it's not at all that. It's more that, you know, can we learn from our mistakes? So if, can we ask ourselves, why is it that, you know, these studies are not being conducted properly? And uh, why is it that uh, the EIs are mismanaged so much? And can we, do, can, can we change that? And, and more importantly, can we get people together in a discussion uh, to do that? So, so that's what I would say. So there's a question by, uh, David, do you want to take the questions or should I, like you want to suggest the questions or should I just continue the way? I... Uh, you can just continue the way. Sure. So there's a question by Soumya that says, thanks very much for telling us. Can you tell us more about how you're planning to expand in India? Are you bringing together tribal wealth or other social development as well? So that's a great question, Soumya. Thanks for that question. And I think uh, the answer to that is uh, we are still in the phase of trying to come to India. So I think uh, the idea there is to try to connect to different people, uh, try to connect to different organizations, see what uh, is needed to, to be done and how uh, to exactly do that. So right, as of now, we have connected to a few uh, different conservation organizations, which obviously is not a great thing because my whole point was about trying to go outside conservation and trying to get a lot of, get a bit of depth in that. Uh, and I think uh, your point about connecting to social development organizations and tribal welfare organizations and beyond that is important. But I think we have to, uh, we're in that stage of having those conversations. Uh, so I think, I think uh, that's what we hope to do. Uh, you know, we just, as I said, we're just starting a social media, but that is just like 1% of the larger thing because social media is not where we should be doing things. It's more on ground. So I think, uh, yes, we, in the long run, we would hope to uh, contact and uh, collaborate with all these different organizations and really find a mutual ground. Sometimes what happens is, you know, people are already working on something, uh, but they don't necessarily talk to each other. So like, if we can facilitate something, for instance, um, like, let me give you a very concrete example. I, we're working with some people in Goa who do a lot of policy related work. So a lot of conservationists, for instance, feel very, very left out because they feel like, okay, um, you know, I'm doing a lot of conservation. It's great. But what is the impact on policy, if at all? And this goes back to the EIA question as well. Uh, so by having these workshops by primarily law based policymakers alongside environmentalists and, and conservation students, what we hope to do is bridge that gap of how conservation science can impact policy. So I think that's some of our uh, some of our plans and thoughts. But we'd be happy to chat more. And you know, if you want to, to connect with some ideas, as I said, I I shared my email at the end, which is India at conservationoptimism.org, so we could talk about that. Okay, so lots of questions coming in. <laughs> so uh, there's a, a question by Mr. Vishwanathan that says. One, what is the relationship between biodiversity? Oh, sorry, I lost it. Biodiversity conservation and spreading of zoonotic disease. This is a great question. I mean, it's a bit outside the topic that I spoke about, but I can briefly speak about it. And I'm not an expert, 
But there is a lot of literature to show. In fact, there's a paper that came out last to last week, if I'm not mistaken, that basically talks about when you have a community of conservations that is more or less intact, when you look at historical periods of time, uh, the likelihood of viruses or you know just pathogens of disease uh, flowing within that community and sort of just not spilling over into let's say uh, humans when you're talking about zo uh, zoonosis is very very low so there's a natural sort of stability of these viruses and if you think about it that makes sense because even the virus that we are all dealing with today coronavirus these viruses don't want to kill us i mean if you think about it if everything kills us uh, you know they're stopping their whole life cycle so actually they, what they want to keep doing is keep persisting in in these populations but it's when destabilize destabilization of these biodiversity communities or or um, ecosystems happen that the chances of mutations that result in jumping of these viruses such as what has happened with coronavirus today uh, the one that, uh, that that is responsible for covid-19 results in uh, these uh, spreading of zoonotic diseases. So it's very important to think about these uh, linkages and conserve these linkages, uh, as I said. And the second point that I was saying, many times uh, destruction of natural habitats, be it forests, grasslands, whatever, freshwater ecosystems, they result in uh, mutations in these species that results in the probability, because they're, they're stressed, which results in the probability of some of these diseases increasing. So I think that's what I would say. Okay, coming down. To Krishna's questions, these are all really great questions. I don't know if I can answer all of them. <laughs> can we make use of the good uh, changes uh, which happen to nature without human interventions in these conscious ways for creating an optimism in people? Well, uh, there's two ways to answer that question, I guess. Uh, I think uh, definitely, I mean, there is uh, there is a lot of different stories that talk about, for instance, how not only with species, like, you know, how the environmental pollution levels have been, in fact, I read a uh, an article the other day that talked about how I think the impact of coronavirus on this, uh, like the greenhouse gases emissions has been in, in the most positive way than other times. I mean, not to say that we should be happy about that because this is a global tragedy and people are dying. Um, so yeah, there are those stories, but we also have to be cautious with the false stories and like, you know, over romanticizing the fact that, um, you know, uh, you know, human, uh, so things might be, really good and wildlife is returning and nature is doing well and whatever. So I think we have to be careful with our information. But yes, we can use this as an allusion um, uh, to allude to, uh, to some of the things. Yes. So we have a question from Clara. Uh, it's only political will that can get things done in India. That is the area where, which has to be tackled first. I agree. I agree. And I think this is where I hope this uh, connects to the point which I said earlier, where I think a lot of us or uh, conservation scientists, and I say this because I believe conservation is an applied um, discipline, right? So a lot of us don't necessarily do exactly what the discipline is, which is to apply it. Maybe we do it in different uh, levels, and I think that's fine, but it's also important to, um, it's also important to, uh, to have the right skills. And I think that's where, uh, Hopefully the ethos of conservation optimism makes sense where it's about sharing stories, but also sharing the tools and resources. Because sometimes we have the right ideas, as you clearly do, Clara, about how political will needs to be improved. I mean, at the end of the day, we don't control the politicians. But what we can do is increase our skill sets and our, uh, our you know, expertise in seeing how we can do that. You know, be it, uh, you know, do we, do we actually know how to write letters to to, to, to our uh, MLAs, you know, for instance, who might be able to actually make a change in our uh, region, for instance, you know, or MPs, for instance. Uh, so I think uh, why political will definitely is a personal and a societal uh, thing, perhaps. I think there is a lot of expertise and resources that people like us can get uh, through, uh, through things like uh, workshops or, or talks, um, you know, under the ethos of conservation of wisdom that can help push us push that to the, to, as an agenda. So then, okay, more questions. Uh, can you explain how NGOs are helping towards conservation, the history behind these organizations? Well, I guess this is, <laughs> this is a very broad question. I guess different NGOs are doing different things and I don't know how 
if I can answer that question, because I mean, that would require me to know exactly what <laughs> different NGOs are doing. But, but I think uh, the way I would choose to answer this question is that, as I said, everybody plays a role in conservation. And you have to understand that everybody has different roles. NGOs have their own roles, you know, forest department, uh, fisheries department, even, even uh, for instance, um, what's it called? Um, a revenue department to a certain extent. I mean, many different departments have their own role. The public has their own role, you know, just the, the mass public. Um, the media has its own role. Uh, I think with NGOs, particularly in India, if I can say, they've generally been, uh, you know, the, the, the flag bearers of creating the knowledge uh, upon which, let's say, conservation interventions or ideas can be based on, and also sort of sometimes doing the, the, the on-ground liaison between some of these organizations that might be disconnected, right? Uh, for instance, I work for NCF, and to give a very small example, uh, like, you know, sometimes what happens is people lose their livestock to snow leopards, because snow leopards kill their livestock, uh, uh, even though uh, they might be wild prey for the snow leopard, it's just a chance. Thing. Many times what happens is, even the revenue department and the forest department was supposed to compensate uh, the herders are not able to do that because you know the herders live somewhere far away um, there isn't a communication happening between the two and also like maybe the herders doesn't exactly know exactly what paperwork to fill or they're illiterate so that's an ngo can step in to bridge that gap so i don't know if i've answered your question entirely but uh, hopefully uh, to give you a sense that there are these multifaceted roles that different organizations and individuals can play. Okay, so we'll go to uh, Pyle's question. This is a very interesting initiative. Thank you, Pyle. Uh, I'm especially interested in the language vocabulary we use while, taking, while talking about conservation issues. Where can I learn more about that from your organization? Great, uh, thanks, Pyle, and I, I agree as well. I think, uh, I think I learned personally a lot through the, the framing of Nature Toolkit, as I was talking about, which really, made me think about, you know, uh, what are your values, which words are good words, bad words, you know, to use, um, what else. It also has, it's really interesting and cute, and I can share this subsequently if people are interested. Uh, uh, it has at least seven things that we should avoid when we are uh, talking about language or vocabulary specifically, but language more generally. When we're talking about nature, how we could, for instance, um, you know, how we, or uh, you, we might euphemize something, but we might actually uh, hyperbolate something else. You know, how when you see a shark, uh, you know, people, we always say it kills people, but actually that's a wrong sort of connection that we have with it. Anyways, I know that I'm not answering that question more tangibly, but I think uh, as, a, as a resource, the framing for Nature Toolkit uh, is a really good one. And I'm more than happy to share it with, uh, uh, with, with, with this group if there is like a mailing list or whatever and in fact in the future we hope to do some workshops around it so so we could do that um, as well i think that's helped me a lot okay uh so then we, okay we have mayurish who has a question hi mayurish hope you're doing well um mayurish and i are colleagues from ncf <laughs> so how would you imagine the field when conservation optimism moves succeeds what kind of indications should see yeah that's a superb question i think i think that's a very uh, good question if you ask me, um, I think there are three things, maybe. I think one indicator for me personally is that there would be more cross, um, what's the word I want to use? Cross uh, domain collaborations. So, you know, conservation is collaborating more. As you can see now already, conservation is already in India, I mean, especially. Conservations are starting to collaborate a bit with, let's say, designers and illustrators because they realize, okay, visual communication is good. But I think we need to collaborate a little more with economists, uh, maybe, uh, you know, I mean, if you look at the whole uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you would, you, would, you, would, you would guess that it's important for, you know, conservation scientists to collaborate more with, let's say, uh, public health officials, for instance, right? So I think one indicator is more uh, uh, sort of mutual co-learning, but collaborations outside our uh, usual domains of collaborations, uh, Mayuresh, I think that's one indicator. I think the other indicator is uh, highly more connected networks. So uh, maybe this is a bit too complicated, but if, imagine if you, know, if you look at India as a network analysis of different, different networks that are working within conservation more directly, uh, in an ideal way, I would like that to be more connected. 
right? You know, because for instance, you know, sometimes like just a personal example again, sometimes we work in a landscape where uh, like we do camera trapping, for instance, for small apples, you know, you'll have one camera trap on one side of the rock and then you'll have two camera traps on the other side of the rock by two different organizations who we don't even talk to, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm sure all of us know this in our own uh, relative sense to a certain degree. So I think the second indicator will be a high, more connectedness uh, between these networks when it comes to, to work, uh, talk and resources. The third indicator, I think, which may be a bit far-fetched, but as I, uh, which was in the theory of change would be more positive trends uh, for species and the environment. So what that means for the environment, for instance, could be maybe we'll, we'll be a little better in achieving, let's say, our sustainability goals, for instance, you know. Um, uh, but especially, uh, but I really want to iterate that it, it doesn't have to be environment and species alone. It has to be at the junction of environment, species, and people's livelihoods and cultures, especially in a country like India, right? So some sort of indicator along that. I mean, the, the, the first thing that I can think of is species trends when I think only of species. So that sort of indicators, but I think uh, it's, a, it's a important one to think about. And I hope I answered that uh, well. Okay, so then we have another question by Deepu. In a capital-driven global economy, how should we look into human relationship in nature, also keeping in mind that conservation is capital driven. Okay, <clears throat> I think that's an important point. I think um, while that is true, uh, especially in a lot of our world today where, uh, I don't know if you guys agree or disagree, but many of our world leaders believe in this whole concept of the free market and the free economy and sort of this neoliberal way of being and I don't want to get into that because neither do I know much about politics nor do I know much about economy, to be honest. <laughs> but I think uh, it's important to, um, to, to understand and communicate that, you know, economics is part of the, the whole thing. It's not the only thing. And I hope, uh, again, and, and I apologize to keep bringing COVID-19 up because I feel like it's really shown us, you know, countries are shutting down today. Why are they shutting down? They're shutting down primarily based on public health grounds, right? Um, um, and economies are at the back burner. And I mean, we can argue this, but that's not, and it's not a linear uh, equation that way. But but you have to start getting into people's uh, mindset that, you know, capital is, is only one of many, many things. And I think the way to do that is through grassroots education, right? Where you have to think about conservation is 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 beyond that. It's about It's about culture. It's about it's about quality of life, well-being. I think that's an important thing we've missed in culture. As I was saying, right, nature, uh, the importance of nature is uh, not only that it provides us with fundamentals, but also with human development and well-being, you know, just our mental well-being. How many of us talk about, you know, the mental cost of uh, being in conservation, for instance, or the mental cost of just living, you know, just uh, like it's, it's quite a taboo still in India. I mean, it's becoming better. So I think it's trying to get to people uh, it's a systemic shift that we need. And obviously a conversation like this is not going to do that. It's more conversations, it's more uh, behavioral change at the level of societies, right? And it's a long, long run thing. But I, I do believe if you, if you inculcate the right uh, uh, knowledge into students and young people, for instance, I think they will grow up with that, hopefully. And we will start questioning our, our systems that exist today, like the way coronavirus has really made us question our economic system in the world, in my opinion, to a certain degree. Uh, we have another question from Mr. Vishwanathan again, which is, sir, can we start a conversation group in a college? Yeah, definitely, with help from conversation groups in and outside India. Definitely, I mean, uh, as I said, I can be more than happy. We can have a subsequent conversation. Maybe I can, through David, send you guys my uh, the email of our uh, of our movement. So, you know, we can talk about how we can actually operationalize some of the very, very theoretical things that I'm talking about, right, in terms of workshops, in terms of seminars, talks, and and so on and so forth. So yeah, definitely, it will be it will be a pleasure. So is that all we have? Uh, I think we're done with the questions. Okay. Yeah. So Munib, uh, thank you so much for like sharing your time with us. I think it's the best time to start conservation of tourism in India because like, a lot of the people who are here are part of any conservation NGO, so like who actively working in the conservation field. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you started uh, that ignited the thought of conservation. Like we hardly started talking about this thing in India. 
So it was a wonderful talk, Mugi. Thank you so much, and I'm thanking you. you on behalf of Arab Naturalist Society and Kote Nature Society. And thank you everyone for being here, and thank you for the questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks everyone for having me. And uh, I think some people are asking if they can get my, the email. So should I send uh, you guys, like Abadosh or David? Should I just send you the d- details and you will share with people, or how should we do it? Uh, yeah, the link is already there in the chat box where you can find. And we can maybe circle it in the Court of Business Society Facebook page. You can find it on. Yes. Yeah, yeah. you can subscribe on the chat box. Your email. Should I type so it in the? Okay, yeah. maybe I'll. Thank you, everyone. It was really nice to talk about it, and hopefully, it was. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. So that's. Uh, oh no! I sent it privately to you. You privately to me. Yeah. I can sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, everyone. There we go. That's... Yes. And just in case that doesn't work, I will have a one more. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, we'll be sharing this. Uh, links to the in the Facebook group of Kotem Nature Society. You can find in more links for the participants. And yeah, thank you everyone for having. Okay.